Hi, it's Bruce Williams again, and here's part two of Selected Gross Pathology of the Swine Integument. As always, I want to thank the folks who have made their images available so I can do what I do. Let's start with a very characteristic skin disease whose de precise etiology has not yet been defined. Porcine dermatitis and nephritis syndrome is a condition of pigs from 8 to 18 weeks of age. It has a sporadic prevalence and usually affects less than 1% of animals in an affected herd, but has almost 100% mortality in these animals, provided that they're less than three months of age. In this particular animal, we see red, purple, raised macules on the skin, which primarily start on the back end of the animal. Over the areas that give us ham and the back legs and the inner thighs and perineum. But eventually they will extend forward over the abdomen, ultimately covering the whole body. Over the course of several days, these discolorations will either resolve or they will expand and coalesce. This particular condition has been associated with a number of different agents, including porcine circovirus type 2, the cause of agent of post-weaning multisystemic wasting syndrome, which is another porcine circovirus associated disease, and in other lectures on swine, we have talked about the many different facets of porcine circovirus infection. It has also been seen in animals infected by the arterivirus that causes PERS or porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome. And it's been seen in animals infected with both Pasteurella multocida and Streptococcus suis, type 1 and type 2. This disease was first described in the United Kingdom in 1993. It is a systemic necrotizing vasculitis, which according to its name has tropism for both the kidney and the skin. If we were to look in the center of any of these purple blotches, we would see a thrombosed vessel. When you look at the kidneys from affected animals, they are swollen with foci of hemorrhage and pallor within the parenchyma. And there is a fibrinoid vasculitis seen in both the skin and the kidney, in the kidney affecting glomerular tufts. But don't think that this is just a glomerular lesion in the kidney because there is significant damage at all levels of the nephron, including the tubules with necrosis and inflammatory cells within the tubules. As we said before, most affected animals ultimately die. It has a high mortality. And here's a great picture of those lesions as they move forward and to begin to coalesce. And you can see that at this point the red lesions have a central area of pallor and resemble an infarct due to thrombosis and they're outlined by an area of hemorrhage with red cells and white cells trying to get in to clean up the devitalized tissue in the center. Here's a disease that looks somewhat like it. A classic disease and a wonderful picture from Lewis Pittman. This is erysipelas caused by erysipelothrix ruseopathy. And this may affect either growing or adult swine. There's a wide range of types of illness associated with erysipelas and it may range from clinically inapparent disease to chronic disease. Acute outbreaks may involve many animals or only one. And we are looking at one of the appearances of acute disease. Peracute disease, especially in young animals, may have no clinical signs and result in acute death. This infarction of the skin is a classic but an inconsistent sign of erysipelas 
Erysipelas is a bacteria that has powerful toxins, including neuraminidase, which will cause endothelial damage and thrombosis. And if we look in the center of any of these classic diamond-shaped patches, and one of the names for this disease is diamond skin disease, you will see a little area of infarction, a thrombosed vessel, and often if you put a gram stain on it, you will be able to find the agent within that thrombosed vessel. Why we th while we think of erysipelothrix is only infecting pigs, it infects a wide range of species, including turkeys, lambs, occasionally other types of poultry, many types of wild birds, and even reptiles and amphibians. So it's always in the environment. And many swine are car carriers of both pathogenic and non-pathogenic strains of this bacterium. Affected animals may disseminate the organism in their feces and their oral nasal secretion, contaminating feed and water and passing it on to unaffected swine. Contamination of skin wounds may be another portal of entry, although this is seen more often in other species, such as turkeys, especially the males who like to fight. After infection, in acute cases, a bacteremia will develop leading to the spread of the organism throughout the body and infarction not only of the skin, but many other tissues as well. This agent, like those agents that cause PNDS, can also result in glomerular lesions and damage to the kidneys. The gram-positive erysipelas is resistant to many environmental influences and survives for long periods of time in pork meat and other types of contaminated meat products, including decaying animal carcasses. As we look at this particular animal, who seems to be more interested in old corn cobs than the fact that its skin is falling off its body. Look at these large black areas of necrotic skin. We would think that this would be a chronic lesion, but it's actually just a few days after that acute lesions. If you see skin lesions, you're looking essentially at an acute case of erysipelothrix infection. The chronic lesions come in two different types. One is vegetative valvular endocarditis, which we've already looked at in the lectures on cardiovascular disease of pigs. And the other is a chronic proliferative arthritis, not fibrinous as we, you would think with an organism that causes vasculitis, but a villonodular proliferation of the synovium and a form of panis, which is a fibrovascular membrane that crosses the articular cartilage, destroying it as it goes, eventually resulting in ankylosis of affected joints. Here's a great picture by Jens Tefka of a pig suffering from hog cholera or porcine pesti virus infection. We've looked at hog cholera many times in these lectures and this is another manifestation of the fact that hog cholera, although it targets monocytes and macrophages to be carried around to the body, within a couple of days will set its sights on the endothelial cells, resulting in significant hemorrhages throughout the body and the skin, especially over the legs where the sick animals will lay down on their front legs, is no exception. And these vessels will become hemorrhagic and necrotic. In addition to further the hemorrhage throughout the body, the hog cholera virus has the ability to infect megakaryocytes resulting in diminished production of platelets. We're now looking at the skin of the back or neck of a pig which has been incised and you can see that the underlying dermis is extremely edematous. This is a great lesion associated with edema disease. We've talked about this before as well and edema disease is an acute toxemia caused by specific strains 
of E. coli that particularly affect the best and healthy, rapidly growing nursery pigs. Edema disease is caused by a hemolytic E. coli that produces two very important products. One is uh, F18 pilus, of which animals susceptible to edema disease have receptors. Most pigs have some receptors. Those who are very susceptible have a lot. And those who have a mutation of this gene don't have the receptors and are thus protected from infection by, or by these particular strains of, of enterotoxigenic E. coli. It is an enterotoxigenic form, so strains of enterotoxigenic E. coli may cause edema disease or they may not, but the animals still will have diarrhea. The other thing that these particular strains can produce is a particular shiga or virotoxin. When this is produced in the intestine of affected animals, it's absorbed from the intestine and targets vascular endothelium and specific sites throughout the body which express a certain type of receptor called globotriosal ceramide receptors. And it's these areas like the mesocolon, the greater curvature of the stomach, skin of the face and the eyelids, and occasionally the brain where edema is formed and the clinical signs are demonstrated. After colonization of the intestine, these bacteria migrate to the mesenteric lymph nodes. They produce their toxins there, and the toxins are adsorbed onto the surface of erythrocytes, where they travel throughout the body and will be exposed to vascular endothelium, especially in the target organs. Here's another great picture from M. Chasen. And the clinical signs in these particular animals range anywhere from peracute sudden death to extensive CNS involvement with ataxia, paralysis, ultimately recumbency. The disease usually happens to healthy pigs one to two weeks after weaning, but it's occasionally seen in nursing or adult pigs. The average morbidity in a susceptible herd is 30 to 40 percent and mortality among affected pigs is often up to 90 percent. Because the signs are extremely variable in some pigs found acutely dead, congestion of the viscera may be the only appreciable gross change, but usually some have evidence of edema of the subcutis of the face, the eyelids, the mesocolon, or any of the other places that we have mentioned. One of the scourges of pig production is foot rot. And foot rot can develop in any age pig, especially those who are being raised in less than optimal conditions. But even pet pigs in the best conditions can develop foot rot. The morbidity in many systems is usually low but may range up to 70% in less than optimal environments. As is the case of foot rot in all of our production animals, it usually is a mixture of organisms, especially anaerobes and microaerophilic organisms. And in pigs, the ones that are most commonly cultured will be Truparella pyogenes, Fusobacterium necrophorum, and the anaerobe Borrelia suae. Let's look at a very famous skin disease of the pig, greasy pig disease, or exudative epidermitis, caused by toxin-producing Staphyacus. This is an acute dermatitis of pigs ranging from a few days old to about eight weeks of age, and is characterized by a variable morbidity as well as mortality. Older pigs may be infected, but it's usually a disease of young pigs. 
And it's not just enough to have the bacterium because Staphylococcus is often cultured as a commensal from the oral or respiratory systems of pigs. There may be an outbreak when a new animal is introduced to a herd who already has Staphylococcus. So there's probably a lot of predisposing factors that we don't know. And many have been questioned. Environmental irritation, trauma as pigs like to chew on each other, especially at this age, and a number of nutritional deficiencies or potential vectors have been incriminated but never proven as a true cause of greasy pig disease. Here is a excellent picture from Dr. Raquel Retch from Texas A&M which shows somewhat the age distribution. Younger pigs and runtier pigs tend to have more severe lesions than those seen in older animals. If you take a close look at the snout of this older animal, you'll see these bulli. And this is one of the things that characterizes uh, greasy pig disease as a close cousin to human diseases of bullus and patigo. The exotoxins produced by this bacteria are metalloproteases that target serine residues in the stratum granulosum and cause cleavage between the stratum corneum and stratum granulosum. So the lesion starts out as a bulla or a vesicle. Eventually that will become ulcerated and then you will have a very proliferative exudative lesion which coalesces across, in this case, the entire body. There are other lesions in greasy pig diseases that are associated with the disease, not just skin lesions, but affected piglets can also show conjunctivitis lesions within the mouth, and once again, kidney lesions. Initial skin lesions are these vocal bulla, ultimately erosions and ulcers around the area of the stratum granulosum, and the lesions will extend to hair follicles and there will be suppurative folliculitis. The reason that the pig becomes greasy and ultimately you have this coalescing greasy exudate over the lesions is that the underlying sebaceous glands will secrete excessive amounts and ultimately you end up with severe epidermal ulceration, exudation, and this exudate will dry up and you'll get this sort of fissuring lesion across the animal. Here is one more image that I show because it's an older pig who tend not to have these generalized lesions we see in the young ones and they have these round ulcerated areas. So I want you to consider exudative epidermitis and the differential for this probably which would also be led by swine pox. In adult pigs, the epidermal lesions may be minimal, but they may develop subcutaneous abscesses, arthritis, abortion, and mastitis. Here's an absolutely beautiful disease. Look at the intricate scroll work of a disease which used to be known as pityriasis rosea, but now is known as porcine juvenile psoriasiform and pustular dermatitis. I actually like the old name. And this particular self-clearing condition is congenital and is usually seen in 8 to 14 week old pigs. And you will see these raised lesions, which if you section them will be marked proliferation of the epidermis, eosinophilic inflammation, Pigs like to throw eosinophils at a lot of lesions. And eventually, if the animals are segregated and the wounds do not become infected, they will go away on their own. Something that's characteristic of psoriasiform lesions in a number of species is the presence of a 
layer of very thick keratin or hyperkeratosis on top of these lesions. Here is a, another case of this. And these are ulcerated because the pig has probably been scratching or rubbing and ripped the top off of these. But if you look at the lesions here, these areas, a serpiginous pattern of raised erythematous epidermis with this thick keratin layer is very uh, characteristic of this particular condition. Additionally, it usually is confined to the abdomen and the inside of the hind legs. Occasionally may come up over the flanks and to the back. This is a great picture of a potbelly pig which was infected with Sarcoptes scabii variant suus. Yes, pigs have their own scabies, as do many species. They're fairly host-specific. They may transiently infect another host, like someone who keeps this pig and takes care of it, but they will not become established. They will not complete their life cycle on anything other than a pig. So it's very specific for pigs. This is the one that causes most cases of mange in swine and all stages of the mite. The eggs, the larvae, the nymphs, and the adults will develop within burrows in the epidermis. And it's spread by pigs in close contact, so larger outbreaks happen in confinement, especially in cold weather. And the mites burrow through the epidermis, which becomes extremely hyperkeratotic, laying their eggs. This is an extremely pruritic condition you can see that this pig is scratched off a lot of this scale because affected pigs will develop an allergic hypersensitivity reaction on top of the presence of the mites themselves. This is a condition that often starts at the front of the pig on the head, especially in the ears, and moves backwards. Many diseases are somewhat directional in pigs. We've talked about poor sign nephritis and dermatitis syndrome, which tends to start at the back and move forward. This is one that starts at the front and moves backwards. One of the earliest places that's colonized on affected pigs is the inside of the ear, and they spread outwards from here. This is an also, also a good place for piglets to be infected by a sow that nobody's noticed yet that she has sarcoptic mange. The lesions first appear as small crusts, and then they enlarge to form these large plaque-like lesions that we've shown you. Here's a young pig with these plaque-like lesions over its face and reddish papules, which attest to the hypersensitivity reaction associated with this particular arthropod and areas demonstrating the extreme pruritus that these animals show. One of the things that is characteristic about infections with sarcoptic mange is that all of a sudden the pens look a little brighter because these animals are so itchy they are constantly rubbing against metal objects in the pen and bring them to a very bright shine. And one other picture of sarcoptic mange. Note the sort of wrinkling appearance to the skin looks like a, a rhinoceros's skin in chronic cases. Although morbidity is high with sarcoptic mange, mortality from mange alone is very unusual. Here's another crusting disease of swine that you might confuse with sarcoptic mange because the skin is extremely thickened and hyperkeratotic. However, there is no pruritus associated with this condition. And the name of this condition is not very creative. It's called parakeratosis, which is also one of the classic histologic lesions. And this is a zinc responsive dermatosis usually seen in pigs from two to four months who don't have access to soil and who are not being supplemented with zinc. One of the problems is usually that of zinc absorption. And 
other elements will compete with zinc. So a diet that is very high in calcium may not allow the pig to, to absorb enough zinc. Also diets that are very high in phytates or, or, also, or other pl plant proteins such as soybean protein may compete and not allow for proper absorption. And zinc is a excellent free radical which inhibits oxidation in the skin and the lack of it results in this progressing hyperkeratosis. Affected pigs show little other than the skin lesions and also reduce growth rate. And in pork production, it's all about the growth rate. The morbidity is mild, the mortality is almost non-existent. And the lesions appear initially as red raised lesions on the ventral lateral abdomen and the medial surface of the thighs. So these lesions may often go unobserved until they are replaced by these thick roughened, sca roughened scales and crusts. Your differentials here will be sarcoptic mange, which is pyritic, and exudative epidermitis, which is usually seen in younger pigs. Affected pigs should have their diet examined well and may need to be supplemented with zinc, but remember that excessive zinc may be toxic as well. Here are some lesions on the front feet and the lesions often start on the distal limbs. Here we can see some other red macules and plaques on this particular individual. Another disease that looks similar to several which we've looked at, including perikeratosis, sarcoptic mange, and juvenile pustular and psoriasiform dermatitis, is dermatosis vegetans. This is an autosomal recessive disease of land-raised pigs, which usually goes through cycles because these animals are often culled out as soon as an outbreak of disease happens. We may go a number of years without an outbreak of dermatosis vegetans in this strain of pig. However, it usually does pop up from time to time. Lesions such as this start in the abdomen, raised red crusting lesions that might be confused with pityriasis rosea, but eventually will coalesce to cover the body. The first lesion that is seen in these animals because this particular change starts around the coronary bands resulting in erythema, edema, and ultimately hoof deformities. So foot deformities come first. The skin lesion comes second. And then eventually, mortality is the result of a particular giant cell pneumonia in which the alveoli are filled with multinucleated giant cell macrophages and a mixed infiltrate, including neutrophils, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. Most affected pigs die within six weeks. Here are some of the early cutaneous lesions before they are covered with dirt and, and other things that gives them a sort of a blackish appearance and you can see the raised acanthotic hyperkeratic lesions which are infiltrated by eosinophils once again pigs like to throw eosinophils at a lot of inflammatory lesions and finally the coalescing lesions in a pig that may also at this point have the pneumonia that characterizes dermatosis vegetans. Most of the blackness is probably the result of incorporation of dirt and mud and maybe a little fecal material within these plaques and crusts and is not a pigment on its own. We've seen this lesion before. There is cyanosis an infarction of the ears and the snout, and if we looked at the other extremities, the tail, probably be infarcted, and hemorrhages in the skin. Another manifestation of porcine pestivirus infection. But this lesion is not limited 
to viruses such as porcine pestivirus and porcine aptovirus. In this picture from Klaus Bergelt, this was aseptosemia resulting from Salmonella cholera suis, typhi suis, actinobacillus suis, or erysipelothrix rusiopathy, all bacteria that circulate within the blood in septicemic animals resulting in thrombosis, particularly of the extremities. For those of you who said, well, where is frostbite? We don't see a lot of frostbite in confinement raising of pigs. We have these things called heaters, but sometimes you will run across a case of frostbite. It's a little different than what we see with the changes seen with septicemia. It often has a very precise line here. Great pictures by Matty Cupel, which shows this really precise, almost surgical line associated with frostbite in affected animals. This is a Yucatan mini pig, which is covered by blisters all over its body, especially the dorsum. Ignore this white material. This was some zinc oxide salve that was put on. This is from a, a research facility which had recurrent waxing and waning outbreaks of bullus pemphigoid within its Yucatan mini pigs. And this is something that this strain of, of mini pig is known for. There have been a number of outbreaks over the years that have been written up. And bullus pemphigoid is a blistering autoimmune disease which is mediated by IgG targeting the hemidesmosomal proteins bullous pemphigoid antigen 1 and 2. And this is a very good demonstration of the lesions that it causes. The vesicles are subepidermal and there is splitting of the basement membrane at the lamina lucida. Remember the basement membrane is split into three zones, two lamina densa and a lamina lucida, and it splits right at that lamina lucida. We're looking at the teats of a sow in this wonderful picture from Martha Delaney. And there is necrosis, especially of the tips of the teat. And this is the result of ergotism. Somewhere this pig was fed feed that had been contaminated by a fungus known as Claviceps purpurea, which infects a wide range of cereal grains and produces a number of active alkaloids, including ergotamine and ergonavine. And this is ergotism. And the primary effect of ergot is to cause arterial or vasoconstriction, ultimately endothelial injury and thrombosis of affected vessels. This is what is seen generally which, with a higher level and may be associated in sows with abortion and agalactia. Just a little level of uh, ergot in the feed generally simply results in, re results in reduced growth rates. There may be necrosis at the extremities in other parts of this pig as well, the ears, the tail, so on and so forth. The agalactia that is caused by ergotism is thought to be related to the inhibition of prolactin secretion. This is a Sinclair mini pig. And look, it's a red pig. These pigs in Durox, which are also red pigs, have a very interesting form of melanoma, which may be actually in these miniature swine congenital, and they may be born with these tumors. And even more interesting than that, these cutaneous melanomas will metastasize occasionally to the internal organs, and then they'll regress by six months of age. Here is another melanoma picture from Klaus Bergelt on a red pig. And 
one of these very large neoplasms. They come in a couple forms. Some are flat and primarily are melanocytes, which recently have been published as being positive for uh, melan A and for PNL2. And then you have these large raised melanomas, which have a very high proportion of melanophages, which are IBA1 positive as opposed to just melanocytes. But they will metastasize, and you think, oh my gosh, they've got to kill this animal, and then all of a sudden they'll be infiltrated by lymphocytes and will disappear. Because of this, they are extremely prized. These animals are prized for use in melanoma research. Just one or two more entities, and we are done. This is a pig whose tail has been traumatized. Uh, initially and then subsequently by its mates because pigs like to chew on each other and the young pigs will suck on the ears and the tails. Uh, this form of trauma is not uncommon. Obviously, it can be a portal of entry for any number of bacterial infections. Here is a, uh, here's an ear that some of the other uh, piglets have been chewing on or sucking on. Obviously, you have to identify the offending pig or piglets and remove them to prevent problems in the herd. And one of the conditions in our last entity for this lecture um, that has popped up over the years as a result of this vice is something called necrotic ear syndrome of pigs, which results in large ulcerated and crusty lesions and occasionally a septicemia. These lesions are initially infected with Staphylococcus, which is always present in a, uh, in a herd, which set up for the invasion of Strepsuis type 2. We know that that's a bad actor and can cause a septicemia. And a number of other conditions generally does not have the ability to cross intact skin, but when it's been traumatized, infected, and damaged by the exotoxins of Staphylococcus, that's an excellent portal and may result in significant morbidity and low mortality. Well, that is going to be it for this lecture. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I look forward to giving you a few more lectures on swine and then moving on to other topics. Thank you for your attention.